buenas tardes a todos. Good evening. Bienvenidos a nuestra celebración del Salvador. I'm Sharon Ahern Fector. I'm the Dean of Humanities here at Montgomery College. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this very special celebration of our partnership with El Salvador. On behalf of our provost, Dr. Brad Stewart, our senior vice president for academic affairs, Dr. Sanjay Rai, and our president, Dr. Dirian Pollard, I would like to welcome the members of the Salvadorian community, the Consul General of El Salvador, Ena Peña, the uh, journalist who will be moderating our discussion tonight, Jonathan Blitzer from The New Yorker, and the executive director of Caracen, Ab Abel Núñez. Uh, we are very happy to have all of you here, as well as our Montgomery College community. We are proud of the work of our Global Humanities Institute, all the work that it is doing with our sister institutions in El Salvador, the University of El Salvador and the University of Central America. Most importantly, we would like to celebrate our many students whose cultural roots are in El Salvador. This event represents the beginning of a week of humanities-focused events dedicated to the beautiful country of El Salvador. After all, it is through the humanities disciplines, language, culture, literature, history, philosophy, that we make these connections, connections that are truly meaningful and truly transcendent. Once again, bienvenidos a Montgomery College. Welcome to Montgomery College. Thank you for being here. So I would like to ask Nestor Alvarengo, the County Sister Cities Program Director, to step up and say a few words. Nestor. Buenas noches, good evening. My name is Nestor Alvarenga. I'm with the Office of Community Partnerships. I'm the Latino liaison for our office and County Executive Legate uh, on behalf of County Executive who couldn't be here tonight. Uh, welcome, welcome to Montgomery County as well. Who's here for the first time? Hope not. <laughs> but if not, welcome to Montgomery County. Uh, it is truly, uh, this program represents what Montgomery County is all about, uh, celebrating diversity and all the cultures around the world. So congratulations to uh, Montgomery College and the um, Humanities Days event happening tonight uh, and to the Global Institute of Humanities. And I have with me uh, Darwin Romero and also Leda, who is over there with the Montgomery Sister Cities Committee of El Salvador. So they're gonna give you a minute, because I only have two minutes. Uh, but again, so uh, we're happy with this event and, and enjoy. Uh, if for some of the folks who don't know, Montgomery County represents, we have a total population of one million folks, and out of that, 20% is Latino population. So we call it 2020. So we're talking about 20% Latino, and guess what? What's the number one country of foreign born population? El Salvador, therefore we have the sister city relation that we started back in 2011 with County Executive Legate, uh, El Salvador, then after that we have Ethiopia, uh, we also have China, and we have India, and the reason why County Executive is not here today is because he's actually on the trip, sister city program in China and Korea, which is our new sister city program that we have. Uh, so that is very well representative of our community and our population here in Montgomery County. Muchas gracias, y con esto, Darwin Romero, unas palabritas about our uh, sister city El Salvador committee. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Darwin Romero, and I came to the United States when I was seven years old, undocumented, and I've lived here for many, many years. I actually went to Tacoma Park Middle School, and I went to Montgomery Bel Air High School, and I also studied at University of Maryland. I'm really excited and happy that Montgomery College is uh, speaking about El Salvador. The Global Humanities Institute is celebrating El Salvador. I'm very proud to be from El Salvador. I love the people, I love the food, I love the culture, and I hope 
I, I believe you're here because you love them too. And so I uh, enjoy the program that they have for today. And uh, I'm part of Sister Cities, part of the board of Sister Cities, the Morasan uh, Montgomery County relationship. And I'm also part of the Morasan Sister City. I'm very happy to be with them and to advocate on behalf of our community to uh, share with you all our culture, our food, our music, and to actually let you know that this uh, coming Friday, November 3rd, we're going to be having a fiesta, and we'd love to have you there. We have a table outside if you want to come by and write your name down and let us know that you want to come. We'd be more than happy to have you at the fiesta where we can share our culture with each and every one of you. Thank you very much. My name is Rita Cremitas. Thank you for being here this evening. I direct the Global Humanities Institute that has created um, a series of events on El Salvador. Um, we are traveling to El Salvador in March. 18 faculty members are going to El Salvador to talk with our partners at the University of El Salvador and the University of Central America about what the humanities mean to them, how they teach the humanities, and the cultural value that they place on the humanities. And so we have done this thanks to the National Endowment for the Humanities. A very generous grant has been supporting us for the last five years, five and a half years. <clears throat> and they are supporting this trip and they're supporting all of our events. Uh, we wouldn't be here without that grant. We are also partnering with China, <clears throat> Xi'an University in China, and two universities in India. Jindal Global University and Osmania University, private and public both. And so El Salvador there, as my colleagues know, is closest to our hearts here because it is us. I am from Greece originally, but I feel very Salvadoran. <laughs> it is us, it's our community, it's our culture, it's what we live in every day. And so it's my great pleasure to bring El Salvador to the light in this way, to link it to academic programs in significant ways, and also to bring experts to speak to us on the issues um, confronting El Salvador today. Um, there's a lot to say, and I'll stop. Um, I want to introduce my colleague, Sarah Ducey, who teaches on the Rockville campus and she's the director of the Paul Peck Humanities Institute that partners with us on Humanities Days. Welcome, we're just so delighted to have you all here this evening and I'm particularly happy for all of the work that Rita and her team um, have put together for this evening and going forward this entire week has event after event and she and her group are teaming across this entire year and really across that five-year grant period to really attend to the interests, um, the culture, the people of El Salvador. And as she points out, this is very close to home, very dear. Um, so I wanted to welcome you all. I wanted um, to let you know that the humanities are an incredibly important part of Montgomery College. We, sometimes we, we like to be all things to all people, and sometimes we really do that. With the humanities, we have mixtures of events with STEM, the science, technology, engineering and math, and Rita has been very, a very strong leader in that regard. And we're um, at our campus at Rockville, we've had poetry this morning uh, from Mario Ben Castro from El Salvador. We've, um, we're really enjoying this, if, as we call it, a deep dive into El Salvador. So welcome. Have a great evening. Thank you. And I apologize if very many great people have participated in putting this event together. Um, you have some of their names here. Um, and Jeanette, Natilius, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice here. Jeanette is in the audience somewhere. Yes, thank you so much for all your work for this event. And where's our artist? Where's our painter? Raphael. Raphael, would you say hello to everybody? Yes, and the many organizations that serve the Salvadoran community, thank you for being here today. I will call our guest speakers, our special speakers to the podium. Um, please come up. And I'll give you just a um, very quick introduction. 
Um, first on the podium here is um, you'll hear different perspectives, different areas of expertise. Uh, first, we have Jonathan Blitzer, who is a staff writer for the New Yorker at the New Yorker, and he's written for the magazine since 2014. He was a finalist for a 2016 Livingston Award. His writing and reporting have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Atavist, Oxford American, and The Nation. So, um, Jonathan, would you like to speak from there? Would you like to come to the podium? You would, okay. So everybody has a choice now. It's a democracy. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, in some ways, I was banking on going last uh, to let the real experts speak. Um, but I, I can offer some words about what it's like to, to write on El Salvador. Um, because it's a challenge, as many of you know, um, getting people here in the US to understand some of these issues, like the issues involving the relationship between the United States and El Salvador, in kind of broad and encompassing terms. Um, it, it's actually quite pleasant to address a crowd like you, because I imagine more than anyone else I talk to, you're particularly in the know on some of these issues. Um, but oftentimes, I I'm dealing with readers who are well-intentioned and, and very much want information about um, what certain patterns of migration are in the US, particularly through Latin America, um, but often don't understand the unique relationship between the United States and El Salvador. Um, and, and so I can speak a bit, just to begin with, about some of how I think through the, the coverage that, that, that I do on the issue at The New Yorker, um, and, and, and hopefully in the process I can, I, I can illuminate a little bit of what, what I think some of the challenges are more generally in terms of making, educating people broadly about how important some of these issues are uh, and, and how, um, how surreal it often is to hear a political discourse that doesn't seem to recognize any of the repeating historical trends uh, that dictate the relationship between the United States and El Salvador. So, so just in a word or two, or three, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this story that I spent uh, several months working on um, because it, I think, defines a lot of the, the way I think about covering El Salvador. Uh, and, and it has to do, in many ways, with deportation. Um, you know, coverage of an issue like this um, is often blinkered in the U.S. by the fact that there's a sort of a phenomenon of out of sight, out of mind, which is tragic, uh, and which I think really, um, you know, threatens to, to, to undo uh, our understanding of our relationship with, with neighboring countries. Um, I spent months working on a piece for The New Yorker about a particular trend uh, in El Salvador. Uh, and it's a bit of a counterintuitive trend. Uh, it's a trend involving call centers and the rise of the call center industry in El Salvador. Um, and the reason I focused in on this trend was because it had a lot to do with general patterns of deportation from the US. And so since the 1990s, and this is where in, in my reporting, I sort of start the clock, as it were. Obviously, the relationship between the two countries goes back much farther than this. Um, but, but for me, kind of one of the key moments in understanding U.S. immigration policies as it relates to El Salvador has to do with laws passed in the mid-1990s uh, and a particular political climate that obtained in the U.S. at that time, uh, a conservative Congress that, ver very much like the U.S. Congress right now, pushed a series of, of sort of broadly anti-immigrant policies and, and, and kind of came into office uh, on the strength of its um, sort of vitriol and rhetoric on those policies. And a Democratic president in, in Bill Clinton in 1996 who felt uh, very much up against the wall needing to prove his toughness on crime, seeing a certain political expediency in passing legislation on immigrant crime. And so key laws were passed in the mid-1990s that essentially established deportation as a central kind of tenet of American immigration policy that um, really only became fully operationalized after 9-11. Uh, more and more money was poured into um, the Department of Homeland Security, which didn't exist in the 90s, uh, came into existence in 2002. Uh, but that created the kind of vast immigration enforcement infrastructure that exists now. And so the numbers since then uh, of deportations have just been steadily been on the rise. And so, call centers. <laughs> um, 
call centers came up for me because I started to hear stories of people uh, who had spent many years living in the US, uh, who identified largely as American or American and Salvadoran, who spoke great English, who had families and lives here, who at some point or another, for various reasons, and often for different reasons, uh, got deported back to El Salvador and had to start their lives anew. Um, and a lot of them started to realize that there was an industry that was particularly well suited to their situation and also their desperation. And that was call centers. Increasingly, throughout the late 90s and early aughts, uh, a lot of international companies have outsourced things like technical support, customer service, um, all of these issues to foreign places. Uh, cheaper to have, to, to have foreign workers who speak English take calls from people like us here. Um, printer doesn't work, there's a problem with our credit card. More often than not, when you call the 800 number to get your problem solved, you're impatient, you're frustrated, and very often you hear on the other end of the line someone who speaks with an accent who's in fact answering your call elsewhere. Um, and it turns out that a lot of these companies moved to Central America during the years in which deportations increased because they could rely on an increasing number of laborers who were desperate for work, who spoke good American idiomatic English, um, and who, who immediately filled these, these positions. And so you have this kind of weird cottage industry that also springs up in El Salvador as a result of this trend. And the cottage industry has to do with English language instruction. You have increasingly deportees starting their own language schools in El Salvador to train people to speak good enough English to work in call centers because the money is good and the benefits are good. And so telling a story like this, um, just to kind of walk you through a little bit of my perception of why a story like this matters is, if, to begin with, it's a slightly um, unorthodox way into a problem that a lot of people are sort of vaguely familiar with. But for me, a key part of this story has to do with telling the, 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 the tale of cycles of deportation and what American immigration policy means in the region. So as, as, as all of you surely know, but many of my readers don't, um, one of the things that makes El Salvador um, a notoriously dangerous place, and obviously El Salvador is so much more than any of the dangers that exist there, and it's unfortunate, of course, that the country is reduced to some of these sort of bare essences, but one of the things that makes the country very dangerous is uh, a raging gang war. That gang war started in the US. People often overlook that. Certainly American politicians overlook that. Um, and and the, the sort of the genesis of that cycle of, of violence began with the mass deportation of Salvadorans from Los Angeles in the 90s. Uh, and over time, those deportees who had gang affiliations that were formed on the streets of Los Angeles and in American prisons started to take root in El Salvador and in Central America. And so there is a character in the center of my story who kind of experienced this trend from every angle. He came to the US when he was three years old in 1980, settled in South Central LA. Uh, he watched as some of these nascent Salvadoran gangs got their footing on the streets of LA. They were often brutalized by rival gangs in the US and started to sort of band together uh, as a mode of self-defense. And over time, of course, and we know the story, they grew increasingly aggressive. Uh, this character, uh, his name is Eddie. Um, Eddie lived this firsthand in South Central LA. Um, and eventually, in the early 1990s, um, partly because his mom was trying to scare him straight, he often got into kind of, he had a lot of trouble at school, nothing ever violent. Uh, his mom said to him and his brother, look, if, if you're gonna continue to act out at school, I'm gonna send you to El Salvador, you're gonna spend a year there with your uncle and you're gonna see how easy you have it in the US. So Eddie and his brother, at the age of 15, went to El Salvador in 1992. Um, and you all understand, in a, and again, in a way that I have to bring my readers along to understand how significant that year is. End of the Civil War, a lot of things going on. And around that time, Eddie was there for a little over a year, around that time you had some of the first um, gang-affiliated deportees arriving in El Salvador. And Eddie was there very much as a witness to their arrival. This years and years before they became the kind of fearsome, as it's now known, transnational gang that, 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 that scares people in, in both countries. 
Um, so the utility of someone like Eddie for me as a storyteller is this allows me already to get you into these kind of nooks and crannies of this very complex demographic trend. Um, and, and I always, you know, there's so much information to impart and often the challenge, and I think one of the reasons why American consumers of news have trouble keeping up and even caring is because if you were to rattle off all of the different factors that are at play in this, it ends up sounding abstract and academic. Um, it was important for me, I think, and it's important for all journalists telling these stories to personalize it, to make very clear what the stakes of these broad trends are. So Eddie can describe what it was like to be spending his year and a half in El Salvador made fun of by all of his peers in El Salvador for the baggy clothes he wore and his, the music he listened to and the way he spoke. He spoke with this thick American accent. Um, but then he could also describe the weird sensation of seeing people who were dressed like him who started to show up in El Salvador and who started to have clout because they seemed cool and they seemed foreign and they seemed new. Um, Eddie ended up coming back to the US, uh, living a, a rich and varied and successful life in Los Angeles before, as a result of some of the laws I mentioned earlier, he lost his green card for a drug possession charge and was ultimately deported. Um, and he arrived back in El Salvador in 2007 to find a completely different country in many ways, um, to find a strange landscape for deportees, um, where deportees, in part because of the history of, of the development of gangs, were stigmatized by Salvadoran society. Um, and he started to look for work and ended up working at a call center. Uh, and Eddie, who was always a, an, a, a bright and scrappy entrepreneur, quickly realized that actually he had a future as, uh, as an English language teacher to prepare people for the call centers. And Eddie, with his kind of characteristic uh, charm, said, look, I'm not a deportado, I'm a deportista. And I think that captured something very essential about his spirit. And it was important for me to capture that spirit too, because Eddie's story is, like, like so many others, is a story full of tragedy, but also a story of resolve and ingenuity and, um, and, and uh, fierce humor and resolve. And um, I'm trying to tell all of these things at once. And so I, I, my, my hope in t talking about this is to give you some sense of how I'm thinking about some of these issues. And, and, and you know, now more than ever, I think it's important for these stories to, to come out because I think it's fair to say, and I think it's fairly uncontroversial to say, that um, the attitude toward immigrants at the current moment, at least as expressed by the federal government, is quite hostile, <laughs> um, to put it politely. And um, I think the more people can understand the nature of some of these connections, the better positioned they'll be to process political rhetoric in ways that I think put that rhetoric in its due context. And so, you know, you have cycles of violence dating back to the Salvadoran Civil War, which the United States obviously had a very, very developed role in. Um, that itself created patterns of migration, refugees, flights, arrivals in American cities. Um, American cities bred gang involvement, deportation, sent the gangs to metastasize back in Central America. That in turn causes waves and waves of refugees fleeing back to the US. These are, these are just constant renewing patterns. Um, and for me, it's extremely important, especially now, uh, to communicate to readers, um, because primarily that's how, that's how people uh, process my work, um, to, that, that, these, that these trends are alive and that these are the results of very specific things that have to do with cultural and political facts in the US. Um, I, I'm gonna, defer to, 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 to these guys, but one, one thing I'll just say lastly is, um, and if this is of interest to anyone afterwards or during a question and answer period, you know, I'm coming from New York. Um, Long Island has a huge Salvadoran community, uh, and a lot of things are going on in Long Island that I've been reporting on involving unaccompanied minors, involving the role of immigration enforcement, ICE, uh, racial profiling around gang membership, um, gang threats. I've been out there over the last five months while uh, the president and the attorney general have each come out to small towns on Long Island, Brentwood, Central Islip, to give speeches about immigrant crime. Um, this is where my reporting is taking me now. And in some ways, it's a kind of companion piece to what I've just described, um, trying to find a way of sort of threading the needle, telling the story both from the Salvadoran side 
um, and from the U.S. side, now in this case on Long Island. So thank you for having me. I uh, look forward to questions. Of course, look forward to the, the remarks of both my colleagues. And uh, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so these biographies are very long because these people have been very active. I would like to introduce, though, and I'm going to cut yours down, Abel, if you don't mind. Um, Abel Nunez, who joined Carison as its executive director in March of 2013. Prior to Carison, he was associate director of Central Romero in Chicago, Illinois. He was primarily responsible for the day-to-day -day operations and communications of that agency. Mr. Nunez migrated from El Salvador to the U.S. with his family in 1979 and grew up in the D.C. area. Mr. Nunez has a Bachelor's of Business Administration degree from Hofstra on Long Island. Before he moved to Chicago, he worked in D.C. for the Latina Civil Rights Center. From 98 to 2000, he was also on the staff of Carison, serving first as its Citizenship and Civic Participation Project Coordinator and later as its Deputy Director. And so um, he's done a great deal. Please make sure to chat with him afterwards. He's a very, very active and effective um, advocate for the Salvadoran people in the D.C. area. And I'll turn it over to you now. Can you hear me? So um, um, first of all, uh, I'm really uh, grateful to have been invited here uh, uh, tonight to speak with all of you. I think this is an important event because it shows how, as a community, we've, we've grown. And, and one, I want to I wanna say that I'm also an alum, so, it, so I'm here with a, sort of a, a sense of great pride. Um, thank you. Um, I, I came to Montgomery College and uh, actually to this campus, the Tacoma Park campus, uh, from 90 to 92 as I was getting my core courses and then I subsequently transferred to, to New York. But it was a great experience for me uh, given that this was a very safe space. Um, uh, it also, uh, it was the reason that it allowed me to continue my education and, and so for that, you know, I think we deserve, you know, Montgomery College deserves a round of applause for that. I also think that, that what this program is doing about sending uh, the teachers that are participating in the trip is, is truly important. During the, the, the 80s when the Civil War uh, was happening in, in, in El Salvador, one of the key components of that struggle was the accompaniment that it received from people in this country. As, as people were struggling uh, to fight the oppress oppressive government and, and uh, what was happening in, in, in Salvador, I think that that connection to this country, uh, so a country that its government was sending a million dollars a day to support the military for 12 years, was also had uh, its citizens going there to accompany people and protect them as they were fighting. Uh, for, for social justice, and I think that that's also very important to recognize. And that I think that sometimes we think of a company only when they're, uh, you know, during the war period, but the reality is that it's needed more now than ever. As, as the country continues and struggles to, to come out of a legacy of war and violence, uh, which still sort of controls its, its destiny, we need the support of everybody involved to make sure that we have a brighter future and that migration um, becomes a, a, a choice and not a means of survival. Uh, so, um, you know, one, you know, Caresen is one of the fruits that, 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 that bore in this community because it, it was born in 1981 by the incoming uh, immigrants with allies as they were trying to address the needs of, of Salvadorians coming in. Caresen was replicated uh, in multiple cities. There are actually five Caresens in total. Uh, we're all independent organizations. There's a Caresen LA, Caresen uh, San Francisco, Houston, New York. Um, and, and together, during the 80s, we worked together to, to, to move the foreign policy of, of the funding of the war uh, and, and help uh, you know, with the recovery efforts. Uh, and then we continue to work to make sure that Salvadorians are, uh, you know, open up spaces in, in, the, in the U.S. So we continue to do in that. But I do think that we need to understand clearly, you know, I'll, I'll speak to the, the point of locally what's happening here, right? So, so right now, the Salvadoran community is the third largest Latino community in the U.S., right? So it's Mexicans who no one will catch. 
uh, Puerto Ricans. You know, they're also citizens, although Trump may think otherwise. Um, uh, you know, they, they have easy, easier time coming to the U.S. Uh, but actually, Salvadoran surpassed the Cuban community about three years ago. Uh, this is the second largest uh, Salvadorian enclave in the U.S., the DNV area, so not one particular city. Uh, LA being the first one, but because the Mexican community also has the largest concentration of Mexican nationals, you know, it, it, it pales in comparison. And, and one of the things that the, the DNV is the seventh largest uh, immigrant enclave, and, and when you look at metropolitan uh, statistical areas, uh, the difference here is that Salvadorians are the majority, right? That's why you can great, get a great pupusa, but you cannot really get a great taco. And I always tell that to my Mexican friends to, to make sure that they place themselves accordingly. And, and the names of the restaurants that said Mexican food are only for identification purposes. It really does not speak to the food that, that is served in there. Uh, but nonetheless, as, as uh, you know, and I'm a product of, of family migration, so I did not come because of the war. And I was lucky enough that my aunt came here in the 60s through the au pair program. By the 70s, she was a citizen and petitioned my father. And so our entire family came. So I do, do not have sort of a profile of, of, of a family that left because of, of, of war. Um, but I do think that, that what was happening in the 80s, and, and I'll speak to sort of my experiences growing up in, in, in Adams Morgan, uh, and, and you know Columbia Heights, it was that when we were really concentrated, when we first came in, we lived only in that area. You know, our borders as a, as a, as a young person growing up in the district was 14th Street, you know, and Connecticut Avenue. We couldn't cross 14th Street because we'd get assaulted by African Americans. We didn't, and, and Connecticut, you know, our, our moms usually worked there cleaning the houses of some of the folks that live on that side. And that was it. You know, but, but the community grew, you know, and, and, and it's amazing. I, I'm, I'm a product of the public school system, Washington, uh, D.C. public school system. Uh, I, I got my first communion at Sacred Heart, which was sort of the religious center of, of, of the community. But during that time, you know, um, in the 80s, there was some mixed flow. So people, I think, sometimes think that who came were just people fleeing violence that was inflicted upon them. But what you also had was a, was a group of ex-soldiers that, that were also coming to the area, you know, with their trauma. Um, you know, there's an interesting story. So La Clinica del Pueblo, which is an incredible health clinic in the area, was born at Carecen. Juan Ramagosa, who now is living in El Salvador, started a program for a lot of the borrachitos, right, the, 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 the drunkards in, in the area to provide health care. What he found that, by and large, most of them were ex-soldiers. And a lot of the clinics didn't want to uh, help them because, you know, Clinica had an ideological sense that we're going to help the people, the people that, were, that suffered. But one of the things that, that he said, no, you know, they need help and, and, and we're uh, going to help them. And, and for those that know Juan Ramagosa's stories, you know that he is a survivor of torture. And he came, you know, fleeing. He got political asylum in the U.S. But as he was doing his work, he actually found his torturer, one of the men, one of the soldiers that tortured him. And eventually, they became friends. And he, the soldier, actually lived with with Juan Ramagosa because he was, you know, living on the streets. And what he realized that it, that just that they were just as much victims of the violence as was Juan Ramagosa. And and one of the things, eventually, you know, he forgave him. And in, in, in one final conversation, unfortunately, the, the torturer, you know, killed himself. And, and he said, the, the, you know, he could never forgive himself for what he did. And so that flow represents who came to the, to, to the early, in, in the early 80s. You know, when, and, and so that, and I also mentioned it, and, and I put the time stamp on it, for us to understand that the Salvadoran community is a young community. I mean, our story in terms of numbers start in the 80s. Don't have, you know, from the 20s. Now, doesn't mean that there were no Salvadorans in the D.C. metro area, but in terms of a community, in terms of numbers. You know, when I was a, a, a ninth grader, and I remember going into school, is when I saw the big explosion of, of that. Now, I'm from San Salvador, and, I, and, and then I have all these new uh, young people coming in, and they were from Santa Rosa Lima, La Union, and we were like, what is going on? Because our friends that had come from the area that were Salvadoran or other nationalities, by that time we had learned how to operate in the school system as young people, right? And then you have all these people coming in, and they're like, oh my God, they're going to mess our thing up. You know, we kind of got it done. Uh, but that created a lot of conflict within our, within young people. 
To this day, people don't know each other because of that. Because as, as they were coming in, you know, they saw us as, you know, they used to call us a, a, a name. We were known as gogueros. And I'll explain that term. Gogueros refers to a music here, and that's, that's particular to the African American community, go go music. Because we had the ability to now speak English and had a lot of friends that were African American. Well, oh, esos son los gogueros, let's not talk to them. Of course, we had really nice names for them too as they were coming in. So it wasn't this mixing as this perfect union of, 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 of newcomers and the people that had been here, we're gonna help each other out. It's like, look, we learned how to work the system and you're messing it up for us. And I think that that is not a new history of, 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 of migration. You know, it's a, it's a history of, of migration. You have also the, the condition of, of broken families. One of the things that the, the, the migration in, in, which, in, in the way in which we came to this uh, area was that usually it was the, the fathers that came first. And then after a while in stability, they brought uh, their, their wives or, or partners and children, but realized that the reunification process is very difficult. So I'm not gonna go into sort of the migration flows because uh, you explained it pr pretty well, but, but I do think that culturally we began to grow. And, and I think that, that what has really changed over this last 30 years is that what the, the point of entry for most Salvadorans was Washington DC. It is no longer that. We are a metro-wide community, right? So there, actually there are more people in, in, in Maryland and Virginia than they are in DC. We got gentrified out. And in terms of the issues that impact us as we're trying to, to integrate, you know, are still many. So for us, in the, in the work that I do day to day, language access continues to be a big issue. And that is because when you have immigrant parents, they do not know how to negotiate the system to put their children in, 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 uh, in the best place for success. For example, you know, I had loving parents. They tried to support me in my educational career, but they had a third and a seventh grade education. You know, I had to fill my college application with my homeroom teacher, right? I, I did not have the, the, what exists now in terms of support as I was trying to, tr trying to do that. And, and when that happens, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible the amount of power that I had as a young child in my family because I was the gatekeeper. And we're still seeing that because we're still a young immigrant community. So language access, and so that means it limits our ability of uh, accessing the resources that are available to us. Part of the work that we do at Carecen is language intervention. You know, and we continue to, to see that. Now we're also beholden to a lot of what's happening in the region. Gentrification is a big thing. You know, I, 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 um, I grew up in D.C., known as Chocolate City, and I always tell folks I went to Chicago for 13 years, came back, and it was like Latte City. And I was like, oh my God, there's, there's change that is happening in the, in, in the district. And it has become really, really difficult to be poor in this area, right? And that just doesn't impact the Latino community, but it has a specific impact on, 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 on communities that are much more vulnerable, that have less access to resources to help integrate. And there's also sort of a stigma attached. You know, growing up, for me, saying that I'm a Salvadoreño, when all you heard in the news coming back to you, now it's gangs, but when I was, it was like the war. That was the only thing, you know, we were known for hard workers and wife beaters. I did not necessarily want to own that as a young person growing up in the city. And it took me a long time to understand the richness uh, and, and, and the courage that our community had in surviving, you know, this violence that, that happened upon them. And then you come into a community that's completely foreign to you, you're trying to negotiate it as you're trying to integrate you know, and as we're moving forward, I think the challenges that we face are how well are we integrating? How well are we engaging the, the political structure and how well are we actually electing ourselves to positions that will allow us to craft policies that better integrate our community? So right now, Prince George's County, and, and I'm a resident of, of Prince George's County, so sorry Montgomery County. I love Montgomery County, I came here, I'm not. Uh, but you know, we have one of the highest levels of elected officials. In, in, in the county. The, the problem is I can count them in like one hand. And, and so we need to duplicate that and we need to create spaces such as Montgomery College because this is where the majority of our community is coming through. So we need these institutions to be strong. We need these institutions to be preparing our young people for what's next to come. Because the reality is that most of the people right now are here legally. They were either through birth or through, or through migration. 
Now, we still have issues with our community. So right now, we're facing the possibility of ending of a program called Temporary Protective Status. November 6th, we'll hear for Hondurans and Nicaraguans, and January, we'll hear for Salvadorans. And, that, and, and in just this area alone, there are upwards of 35,000 people that are under that benefit. I mean, companies like Clark Construction are probably going to lose 20% of their workforce if that program is ended. Unfortunately, we do have an administration right now which is trying to close all access to temporary programs and even limit um, um, legal migration. So I think that we have challenges ahead of us. Language, access to political power, housing, all of those issues are still relevant and it's what we work and a lot of the organizations that were out in the tables there kind of work to, to help. But I do think that we need to sort of honor everything that we're here. You know, as I look at, at this campus I was, I, I was coming in, and it's an incredible, beautiful campus compared to where I was at, you know, and I asked myself, how many Salvadoreños helped build this building? You know, when we talked about 9-11, who do you think reconstructed uh, the Pentagon? You know, it was our community, right? Who remembers Arlington? Who remembers Silver Spring? You know, when it was a small, sleepy town, and now it's an incredible place to be. So I think that, that, that there's a lot of research that we have brought to the table. There's a lot of, uh, a, a, a lot of what this community has um, sort of gained has been a plus benefit for, for, for our community. And I think there are a lot of Latinos that have taken advantage of that. I think there's still a lot of work to be done. And I would just say by ending it that this is a perfect place, an example of where a, 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 a community college it is the first entry for a lot of uh, newcomers to this land where they get the entry into higher education then that leads to the possibilities of becoming more. And so I think that we are here working to that. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to your questions. So I'll leave my presentation there. Um, so, um, brief bio of um, our Consul General for El Salvador yeah, here in Silver Spring. Anna Pena is currently the Consul General of El Salvador with a seat in Silver Spring. She has a first degree in marketing and a second degree in economy. As a human rights activist for women in El Salvador, she participated in reforming of important laws and was directly responsible for economic chapters of the law Equal Opportunity for Women. She also coordinated the construction of the Monument for Memory and Truth in, con in honor of the civilians, victims of human rights violations during the Civil War in El Salvador, which is located in the Cuslatan, no, Cusclatan, <laughs> whatever, park in the city of San Salvador. She was the vice consul for El Salvador with seat in Boston, Mass., in charge of all consular affairs for all Salvadorans, not only in Boston, but also for New England, for a community of approximately 160,000 Salvadorans. She participated in the opening of the new and improved facilities and in important projects such as Casa El Salvador in New England. She was a promoter of culture in East Boston, where she had the opportunity to coordinate a variety of activities aimed to facilitate knowledge of the Salvadoran culture and its traditions. In 2014, she was transferred to the Embassy of El Salvador with seat in Belize, Central America, as first secretary and in charge of consular affairs and communi communitarian affairs. She organized a series of cinema cycles to promote national talent in schools and churches. During her post as Consul General in McAllen, Texas, she, has under, she had under jurisdiction almost 40 counties from the south of Texas. She was in charge of the op opening of the consular offices at the Embassy Road in downtown McAllen. Consul General Pena has a 22-year-old daughter who is currently studying to achieve her degree in graphic design at STC in Texas. Welcome. Good evening. First of all, I want to uh, thank the Global Humanities Institute, Rita uh, Carnitis. Thank you for inviting me, for giving me this opportunity to be here. And I think this is my first speech in English language with this big audience. I used to speak with uh, a small spaces, but <laughs> yeah. I hope to play a good role today. Well, the, consul, uh, the, the consulate network of El Salvador in the U.S. 
is forming with uh, 18 locations. Let's see, 18 locations nationwide and provide assistance to Salvadorians in different areas. Every location may have uh, some characteristics depending on the place and the demand of the people and their circumstances. For example, it's not the same being the council of the South Texas border uh, of U.S. than being here in Washington or Silver Spring. The activities and the consular protection for the Salvadorian population will be very different. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of El Salvador, aware of the need of Salvadorians living in the U.S., is willing to support our connational providing the services of documentation like passport and Salvadorians ID that we call it DUI, not a good word, but and many other, consul, uh, many other consular services, as well to open a new and nearest location to verify the due process in the application of the immigration policies here in the, the States. Um, uh, part of this is because we were in Washington, D.C., you remember that we have a, a facility on Wisconsin Avenue in Georgetown that is not a place that represents us as Salvadorians. So uh, we try to get closer to the community. So we move our offices to Montgomery County uh, last February. It was a it was a big celebration and it was a big step for being closer to the Salvadorian community that uh, demand us a lot of, uh, a lot of services. Um, it, um, and another example is in 2014 and 2015 during the crisis of unaccompanied children, El Salvador opened a new consulate in McAllen, Texas in order to provide human assistance of the family units that were coming and to the unaccompanied youth and children. South Border Consulate helped families to communicate to each other while they were captured by the Border Patrol or, or if they were at the ICE detention centers. We helped uh, relatives to, lo to localize their beloved ones and we informed families about the condition of their children during the process with ORR and the youth uh, centers in Texas, and the worst place uh, on earth is the things that they call Las Yeleras. There is a process centers from uh, um, the Border Patrol agencies. Sometimes when uh, women with nine months of pregnancy chose up to the bridges borders at the Rio Grande Valley. The consul of the South Border is responsible to take her, this pregnant woman to her family. Sometimes they, sometimes a woman uh, give birth or, or over there, so we must, uh, the consul must visit them and provide all the documentation to take the newborn baby to their families here in the States. So it's a very complicated uh, work uh, co in, in comparison with this uh, in Silver Spring. The mission of the Foreign Affairs Ministry is to give consular services that promote the respect human rights of Salvadorians overseas. El Salvador has one embassy here in the US, 14 general consul and four consular offices. Let's see if I have this. Okay. Um, we know that about 2 million and 8,000 Salvadorians live in the U.S. 51% are males and 49 are females. And we are a country of 6 million uh, people. So half, almost half of the, the population lives in the U.S. You can see the first a state of major concentration of Salvadorian is California, followed by the DMV area. And the third state, it will be in Texas, uh, Houston and Dallas. During two, 
2016 Salvadorian consular offices in the U.S. provide about 200,000 passports nationwide to Salvadorians. This number is very close of the amount of passport that our office in El Salvador produce. So we are almost doing the same uh, amount of passport uh, like uh, as, as our offices in El Salvador. I got a little lost. In 2001, uh, El Salvador suffered uh, two earthquakes, and the U.S. government gave the benefit of temporal permit status called TPS. TPS is a temporary protection of deportation that the U.S. gives to countries with natural disasters and internal political problems. After that, Two eighty thousand Salvadorians were allowed to work legally, but this year we received the announce that the benefit of TPS perhaps will end it. Salvadorians will not have the opportunity to continue with this benefit. Our government, through the Embassy of El Salvador in Washington D.C., took action since the beginning and start to speak with the diplomat in respectful way with the new administration. And the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Hugo Martinez, have come to the U.S. to meet the business people, local government, and federal government in order to ask the renewal of the TPS. Ms. Minister of Foreign Affairs asked the Department of Homeland Security uh, last August to renew this. Every 18 months, uh, as you know, every 18 months, TPS holders need to renew their work permit, and also they go through a very tight process of biometrics and fingerprints to show the USCIS that they don't have any criminal records. TPS holders are working people. They have been here for de decades. They took care of their families and also enriched their communities. In Montgomery County, there are 30,000 Salvadorians that have a TPS status. They are well-behaved people and deserve the right to renew the TPS and also in the future to get a permanent status in the U.S. The consulates of El Salvador have provided the space of our facilities for people with TPS to organize and planning strategies to struggle from different arenas in order to obtain the renewal. We accompany the TPS groups nationwide and also here in Maryland we have worked with them to ask and obtain supporting res resolutions from cities and counties. For example, Hyattsville, Mount Rainer, Brentwood and Prince George's County have passed a resolution that support TPS and DACA holders, and they have sent letters to the federal government to ask a renewal of both TPS and DACA. As you may know, some Salvadorian's family are composed by parents with TPS and children with DACA. According to the data from the State Department, nowadays there are about, um, there are about um, 62, almost 63,000 uh, people with DACA have uh, 32,000 are male and 30,000 are women. And now we have in 2015, like uh, 194 uh, people with TPS. Oh, um, there is a data that I think is important. Uh, almost the 57% of the total of people with DACA are younger than 20 years. So it's a very young population. Uh, yesterday in Washington, there were 50 TPS committees nationwide with one wall to ask federal government and the Congress to renew all the 18 more months and also prepare the condition to ask for a permanent status. Hundreds of TPS holders will be at the Congress talking to their representative and asking for a permanent status. 
10 countries, including El Salvador, has a TPS. We will hear an announcement on November the 8th for Nicaragua and Honduras, and on January the 5th, we will know if the current administration will approve a renewal for a TPS. I would like to ask you to stay informed and inform other Salvadorians or Americans about this situation that the, Salva the community of El Salvador are living. Consular protection consists in providing legal assistance to Salvadorians, uh, to Salvador Salvadorians. We also provide Salvadorian police records. We verify the due process in the detention center of ICE. We, are, we always provide advice for many situations. Most of our connational in this area don't have any status in the U.S and many offices will accept a passport or a valid ID. The Salvadorian passport is our most demanded service. We put a special attention and provide all the documentation to our national that need it, because this will be a very important element of the consular protections. Salvadorians use their passport, the passport not, not for traveling, but to enroll children to the school, to clinics, to buy a car, to get a bad account, to go to a court, and to get a driver license, and many other businesses. We also have alliances with, uh, with other consulates from Latin American countries, especially with Central America and Mexico, because we face similar problems with our connationals. We together verify the due process, and also we visit together the detention centers of ICE. The consulates of El Salvador are also a space for culture diffusion. In this year, we have celebrated many important days. For example, the number, uh, the 100th birthday of Monsignor Romero, uh, Casa El Salvador, were there, and we were very uh, happy as well uh, celebrating this day. Uh, we have a uh, we have a exposition and we also have uh, poets over there. We also celebrate the Corn Festival in which many women who cook our traditional food that comes uh, from corn, uh, like pupusas and atoll, more than 400 people uh, attended to the Philadelphia Avenue. Um, I would like to end it, um, I will close the speech by saying that we ha also have a program as a government uh, that we call El Salvador es tu casa, El Salvador is your home. This program is for people who go to El Salvador after years of living in the U.S. Uh, uh, maybe they face deportation or, or they only want to come back to El Salvador. So we cons we, it consists in giving economical and psychological support and also to help in different ways to the reinsertion of the people who face deportation. Uh, we provide educational programs, technical accreditation, and supporting with food, financial credit, and many other issues. Um, thank you uh, for your patience and understanding me. <laughs> I hope you understand me. Um, I will, I, will, I will invite you to visit uh, the Consulate of El Salvador. We are here, we are neighbors, uh, and to be informed of our activities. Um, thank you very much. Um, so next on our program is I'm going to call up, um, let's see, uh, God, where is she? Pat Maloney, would you come up please? Okay, and this is next on our agenda. We have every year at um, Humanities Days, we award the um, Humanities Leadership Award to a very, very deserving person. It's our chance to celebrate um, the wonderful support we get from specific individuals who go above and beyond. And here from the Grants Office is Pat Maloney to introduce our recipient for this year. Thank you, Thank you. Buenas noches. <laughs> it is such an honor to be here tonight and to talk about how we all got here. It was because of a grant. 
It was an idea that turned into a grant over five years ago for the Global Humanities Institute. And it is because of a wonderful person who is called a grants manager. But a grants manager is a number of things, a psychiatrist, a detective, an author, an editor, and in this case, with this person, very much an architect. Amy Gumar did not grow up planning to be a grants manager, nor did any of us, but she has shown what you can do with a passion and understanding for the humanities and an ability to formulate an idea to really be an architect and help with that design. And on behalf of the Office of Grants and Sponsored Programs, which is part of the Advancement and Community Engagement Division, I am here to honor and give a shout out to my colleague, my friend and my office sister, Amy Gumar, who has made a big difference in the arts and humanities at this college. They don't want us getting things out of this box. Okay, so let's see if we can do this. Um, so you all should know that Amy was very responsible for the grant that we are celebrating today, um, our six-year grant. And she was also very responsible for our new NEH grant. And she is a hardcore supporter of the humanities. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. We're happy to present you with this award. That's wonderful, thank you. It's, it's very pieces. heavy. Okay, wow. It's very heavy. It's free floating. Uh, I think somebody needs to take a photograph. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. This is just You're awesome. Welcome. Okay, actually, I'll pass it back. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Um, thanks, Sarah. Give me a deep wave now. This is great. Yeah, I'm excited. Let me just grab my presentation and there we go. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, I'm just thrilled to be here. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Sarah. This is a really great feeling to be honored in this way. I'm so grateful to accept this award um, because, you know, the Global Humanities have par are part and parcel of who I am. And I thought, um, while I'm not talking about El Salvador tonight, I should just add that it was my idea to include El Salvador in the grant. Thank you. <laughs> and before I start my presentation, I'll tell you why. Because I looked at the demographics of the county. And when you're a grant writer, you do everything with data and you think about things. And I, I also had a fondness in my heart for El Salvador. Um, Evelyn Gonzalez Mills had been a friend of mine. She early on encouraged me to join a delegation to El Salvador, which I couldn't at the time. But I remembered what we talked about. And when I went to write the grant, I thought, let's capitalize on the county's existing partnerships. And so we did that. And it's worked out beautifully. And I think we complement each other, the work of the college and the county. So I'm excited about that. But what I'm here to do right now is to share with you uh, my own personal philosophy of why I think the humanities remain vitally important and hold tremendous value. And this is a kind of interesting story from my perspective. It's a story about labyrinths, cave paintings, epic poems, unexpected commonalities, and intersections. And somehow it all makes sense, I promise. Uh, for my part, the study of the humanities has been a lifelong interest and one that has often held international dimensions. I received a Doctor of Arts degree in humanistic studies from the University of Albany, State University of New York, in an interdisciplinary program combining coursework in German, art history, and the humanities. I study abroad at every level of my education, from high school to graduate school. The knowledge gained through that study has helped me contemplate the complexities of life and con conceptualize what I like to call my own map of the labyrinth. That's not quite it, but that gives you the idea. Um, it's a kind of personal blueprint of what the Argentinian writer and poet Jorge Luis Borges so brilliantly called, and I quote, the divine labyrinth of causes and effects that underpins our singular universe of diverse beings. This summer, my husband Peter, who's sitting in the audience, and I, uh, we had an opportunity to travel to France. And we spent some time in the Dordogne River Valley, which is pictured here. 
And we also visited the town of Les AZ for a purpose. We wanted to see cave paintings. And we were actually able to join a small group that entered the last cave in France where you can still view authentic cave paintings. And these date from 17,000 BC from the Magdalenian period. And I'll just share with you what this looks like to enter this cave. This is at the Grotte de Font de Gaume. It's just an amazing place. And when you go in there, you, you see paintings that were made by Cro-Magnon Man, who was among the first early modern humans. And the paintings depict bison, bears, horses, reindeer, woolly mammoths, rhinoceros, among other animals. They're elegant. They're simple. They have an almost 3D quality because they follow the contours of the cave. And they're just, it's an amazing experience to go and see these. Professor Martin Pops wrote, at Font de Gaume, Le Comparel, etc., ancient man discovered the secret of the winding cave, that it is a labyrinthine threshold between profane and sacred zones. He further wrote, the animal art of ancient man is our first evidence of human unconcludedness and the dangerous winding cave, our first metaphor of the soul's uncertain journey. These ideas really resonated with me, and I can tell you there's something indescribable about the feeling you get when you stand in front of these ancient cave paintings and etchings, where recognizable images of animals commingle with abstract signs, dots, and engravings. And I'm just going to walk you through just some examples. Um, the two you just saw were from the Grotte de Fontagam, but these are from Lascaux, where we also visited. So just to give you an idea. These are, this one's called the falling cow and the frieze of the small horses. And these are the famous Chinese horses at Lascaux. And this one is at the New Museum, Lascaux 4. They actually have these really interesting interactive things where they illuminate uh, some of the etchings. And you get the feeling of what it would have been like if somebody was waving a torch back and forth and you could see the movement in all these animals. It's really interesting. As I viewed these paintings and contemplated their meaning, and of course, also, Rita had said to me before I went to France, hey, you might get this award. And I'm thinking, i got to come up with something to th talk about. But it did resonate with me. And while I was standing there viewing these paintings, I thought, you know, isn't this essentially what draws us to the humanities today, this idea of this uncertain and unconcluded journey at the intersection of the known and unknown? The Paleolithic cave art speaks to the very heart of the human experience. The paintings, as Dr. Ilsa Vickers explained, give a glimpse of eternity between two worlds, the finite and the infinite, the conscious and the unconscious. This was a time of the great Ice Age hunt. It was a terrifying time when existence depended on the ability to hunt the bull and bison depicted on the walls. And yet clearly the cave painters felt a deep reverence and connection to these animals. The inner sanctums of these caves feel like temples and holy places. 20,000 years later, the world is still a very scary place. We are all of us bombarded daily with information. It's mostly negative from multiple sources, whether it's social media, newspapers, or television. We need to sort, filter, and process all this information. And for me, the humanities are the sanctuary. They bring a sense of semblance and peace in a chaotic world and help me retain what Borges called that kernel of myself that I have saved somehow, the central heart that deals not in words, traffics not with dreams, and is untouched by time, by joy, by adversities. But even with that map, I still am what I am, and I'm still falling gracefully down this path that I don't know, as the Colombian-born singer Juliana Ronderos of the group Salt Cathedral sings in the lyrics for her song, No Ordinary Man. But having a map is still better than not having a map when you're wandering around a labyrinth or within the confines of a dark cave and our students need their own maps if they're going to survive and master the twists and turns of life. And this is why it's so critical to create rich learning environments that invite and inspire them, in Noam Chomsky's words, to discover on their own, to challenge if they don't agree, to look for alternatives if they think there are better ones, to work through great achievements of the past, and to try and master them on their own because they are interested in them. As I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about tonight, my first instinct was to go to my own repository of knowledge, which is the bookcases in my home office. And I pulled from among my favorites, The Renaissance Philosophy of Man, which is a book I've turned to again and again for inspiration. It's actually a compilation of essays translated into English. And its purpose was to acquaint the student of philosophy with major thinkers of the early Italian human, uh, uh, Renaissance. 
In trying times, I'd like to turn to the Italian humanist Giovanni Pico della Mirandola's oration on the dignity of man. It's a beautifully written celebration of human beings and of our potential. Written in the 15th century, it has been called the Manifesto of the Renaissance and remains a critical text of Renaissance humanism. Of the early humanists, I'm drawn to Pico because he imagined a world where human beings exist above beasts and below angels, hovering sight, right there in the middle zone. And as many of the early humanists did, Pico celebrated our ability as humans to make choices. As he saw it, we can aspire to be like angels, or we can descend into depravity like beasts. We can become what we will, he wrote. I find his recognition of the mutability of our nature and of our enormous potential thought-provoking provoking and inspiring. And it's fascinating that today, the capacity to change and grow our minds has been proven to have a profound impact on learning, as evidenced by the work of Stanford psychologist Dr. Carol Dweck in her groundbreaking work, Mindset. Dr. Dweck's research provides an inquiry into the power of our beliefs and how changing even the simplest of them can have a major impact on nearly every aspect of our lives. Her research has demonstrated conclusively that the hand you're dealt is just a starting point. What you do with that hand is up to you. It's your intellectual agility that is the key to self-improvement. As Pico understood it, man is the intermediary between creatures, the intimate of the gods, the king of the lower beings by the acuteness of his senses, by the discernment of his reason, and by the light of his intelligence, the interpreter of nature, the interval between fixed eternity and fleeting time, and as the Persians say, the bond, the marriage song of the world. There's something so uplifting and poetic in Pico's call to let a certain holy ambition invade our souls. From my own experience, I know that the study of the humanities has the power to illuminate, sustain, and inspire, and maybe even heal. I've benefited greatly from the many opportunities I've had to study them in depth, both in the United States and abroad. My engagement with the humanities is ongoing. Looking back, I realized that my interdisciplinary study of German literature and art history has helped me appreciate and see unexpected intersections and commonalities across different artistic mediums. For example, I never would have been able to understand the post-impressionist painter Paul Cezanne's use of passage, a painting technique he used in his landscapes and still lives, where multiple viewpoints are presented in a single glance, had I not read the Latin epic poem, The Aeneid. What really helped me understand Cezanne's passage technique was seeing how Virgil presented time as a fluidity of moments in his epic work, a work in which the gods have the unique ability to travel effortlessly across a continuum of time that embraces the past, the present, and the future as one constant. Standing in front of one of Cezanne's paintings, I suddenly understood what he was trying to achieve. In Still Life with Basket of Apples, pictured here and completed around 1895, Cezanne features a basket of apples spilling out onto a wooden table covered by a heavily creased tablecloth. The painting is rendered from a series of multiple and shifting perspectives. The various objects, including the unnaturally tipped basket of apples, the dark green wine bottle and the yellow biscuits stacked on a white dish, all cling together tenuously while appearing to slide off the picture plane. Time is not presented as one single moment, but rather as a snapshot of multiple moments isolated in a single glance. Both Pico and Cezanne created an illusory world, not unlike that of the cave painters 20,000 years before. It's a world where temporal time is suspended and reconceived according to some unexpected internal guidelines, which while alien to us, transfix us with their familiarity. The humanities likewise provide a whole glimpse of another existence. They invite deeper thinking that extends beyond the obvious and into the mysterious. Walt Whitman captured this idea in his preface to the Leaves of Grass, in which he wrote, I do not doubt that exteriors have their exteriors, interiors have their interiors, and that the eyesight has another eyesight, the hearing another hearing, the voice another voice. The romantic poet John Keats considered a willingness to embrace uncertainty and mystery as qualities that could form what he called a person of achievement. Keats coined the phrase negative capability, which is the ability to function in the face of uncertainty, mystery, and doubt without grasping after facts or reason. He said Shakespeare possessed it enormously, I think the cave painters possessed it too. And as I see it, negative capability 
is the ability to live the questions, embrace ambiguity, and persist in the face of uncertainty. And that, for me, is what the humanities provide. In addition to being a sanctuary, they nurture a kind of intellectual resilience. They help us discover and contemplate who we are, why we're here, connect with our creative sides, and expand our possibilities of perception. My own path through the humanities has helped me consider issues of identity, as I hope our new project, Many Voices, One College, will do for our students. My story is one of a 16th generation New Yorker. There are a lot of New Yorkers in the audience tonight, I think. A German American whose many English maternal ancestors from my mother's side of the family were trained as teachers, educators, and writers. Their work included serving as governesses, as the lady on the left, as teachers in one-room schoolhouses, as elementary and high school teachers, and as journalists and writers. I'm so proud to represent a legacy of six continuous generations of women educators in my family and I accept this award in their honor and memory. Our students at Montgomery College bring tremendous potential with them when they arrive at our college. A large percentage of them are immigrants and non-citizens. Many of them speak a different language at home or are immersed in a culture that's different from ours when they leave the college environment. When they arrive in our classrooms, we must embrace their experience to keep them engaged and interested. I believe strongly we can do that by providing a place where they can share their stories and contribute their own narratives, where they can begin their own journeys. Global learning allows that because it creates space for students to share the story of their own rich heritage, to compare that to someone else's, to discover the differences and find the similarities. It holds the potential to reveal what Borges called explanations of yourself, theories about yourself, authentic and surprising news of yourself. The educator John Dewey wrote that interest operates by a process of catch and hold. First, the student's interest must be captured and then maintained. Peaking interest is about seizing attention and stimulating the imagination. And this is an arena where the global humanities thrive and excel. I'd like to conclude with an illustration from my great-grandmother's astronomy textbook. This is dated 1869. And if you can believe it, at that time, astronomy was thought to be ideal for women to study. My how times change. Um, and I'm thrilled to be recognized as a leader in the humanities because I think the humanities have the power to save mankind. If we become deeper thinkers, more thoughtful and insightful, if we are able to understand nuance and navigate through ambiguity, then maybe we can all avoid the pitfalls of polarized thinking that leads to extremism and ultimately to war. Maybe it can help us chart our own path through the labyrinth, gain some Keatsian negative capability, and become more receptive to the beauty and wonder that surrounds us. I'd like to end by urging you to let the humanities help you live the questions and to brave the downward inward journey to the uncharted regions of your mind, just as the cave painters did. Thank you for this tremendous honor. I am deeply humbled. Thank you.